great to be here, uh, first event. Obviously, uh, excited to be invited, so thanks to the organizers, thanks for coming. A lot of times, people don't really look at supply chain as being all that interesting, um, which is why the title is The Silent Exponential. And yet, if you really do look at it, there's a lot of money, something we haven't talked a lot about. We've got molecules, and we've got satellites, but um, I teach in a business school, so money is really kind of important. And so you can find a lot of money in supply chains, and you also can find a lot of innovations in supply chains, but supply chain people don't really trumpet this much. So let's talk about the money first. Anybody know Coyote Logistics? Nope. It's a third-party logistics provider. It's a lot of very uh, software-intensive algorithmic intensiveness, intensivity. Um, UPS bought them for $1.8 billion. Not bad for a startup exit strategy, right? That's a supply chain play. Kiva Robotics right here in Boston was bought by Amazon in 2012 for about $775 million. Again, this is supply chain robots. This is unglamorous, but game changing. Um, a lot of stuff we're talking about, wearables. You know, wearables for fitness, wearables for medical. We've been doing wearables in supply chains for 25 years. I'll show you a picture in a second. Barcodes. Barcodes, the oldest information technology many of us can think about. That's a hyperlink. Nobody called it a hyperlink back in 1944. Lasers, satellites, autonomous vehicles. So here's the ring scanner. This is a wearable, a wearable computer with a sensor on it. Lots of buzzwords there. This is ancient technology in a supply chain warehouse. Here's an autonomous vehicle pilot. This started in 2009 in Europe. These are Volvo trucks in what's called a platoon. The lead truck is driven by a human driver. The following trucks have human drivers that will uh, abdicate control because the machine can sense and respond faster than the person can, which means following distances shrink, which means that they can then have better fuel economy. They take up less space. You can get more use of the roadway. Um, Big deal, very big deal. This is 2009 that this started, and it's still ongoing now. Um, the trucks are now connected by Wi-Fi. You can see the antennas on that lead truck. So where are we going next? This is a conference about the future, not about the past. So some drivers, some implications, and some barriers. And a lot of this will touch on notes that you've already seen before. Drivers, connectivity everywhere, the fact that we can now talk about satellites, we can talk about Wi-Fi being pretty ubiquitous, certainly cellular is ubiquitous. Most of the planet has wireless coverage now. You'd never know it from being in some parts of central Pennsylvania, but in fact, wireless coverage is pretty much ubiquitous. Think about computing 50 years ago, it was in a data center, it was in a big room. 30 years ago, it was on a workstation, now it's in our pocket. In the next five, 10 years, computing is moving out of the box into the world. Whether it's robots, you saw the beam in the innovation lab. You talk about robots um, in many um, autonomous vehicle scenarios. You can talk about 3D printing as being computation that affects the 3D world. The Nest thermostat is computing outside the box. There's lots and lots of examples. And so this is one of those exponentials where you bring Moore's Law dynamics into the physical world, lots of interesting things happen. Once we stop thinking of a computer as a beige box that sits in our desk, or a gray box that sits under our desk, and starts putting, you know, embedding computing in lots and lots of things. Finally, algorithms are getting better, taking advantage of Moore's Law, and advances in software engineering. This is often the, it's harder to draw a curve of software improvement, of algorithmic improvement. But we're seeing this in pricing, in shelving. Anybody know what chaotic storage is? Chaotic shelving. So Amazon, if you think about going into your local uh, Dick Sporting Goods, you walk in and say, I want a size 10 Puma XYZ. And so they say, okay, we have this in blue, we have this in red, we have this in black. And so there's a, red, there's a range of the blue ones, there's a range of the black ones, and there's a range of the other uh, color. And we see that we get to, oh, there's no size 10. We have size 9.5, we have size 10.5. Amazon doesn't work that way. Anytime there's an open storage spot, there's a barcode underneath it, there's a barcode on the, on the item being sold, those are both scanned, matched, and the thing is stuck into the open slot. So you can have a bowling ball next to a USB stick, next to a carving knife. Doesn't matter. There's no rhyme or reason to the shelving except what's known through the barcodes. 
Why does this matter? They increased their storage density 50% by moving to the shelving algorithm. 50% free space. And then shipping. If you think about right now, Amazon knows the weight in the grams of every single item they're going to sell you. Now think about the world, what happens when you charge, if you're UPS, charge by volume. All those air packets that are in your Amazon box are no longer free. So now how does Amazon do the combinatorial calculation of the volumetric optimization for that box with the bowling ball, USB stick, and carving knife. Incredibly hard problem, fascinating problem. So here's the pricing in real time. Um, anybody know Tractor? That's what they do. They, they track Amazon price changes over time. The top thing is a pair of headphones. The bottom thing is a USB stick. Note how much volatility it is. The uh, green bar is the uh, new item, and used market is the gold underneath. Note that sometimes the new is cheaper than the used. And this is for every item Amazon sells. Just think about the computation that's required to manage this, and then your demand chain and your supply chain now work together. When are we running a promotion on something? When are we going to have too much stuff? When, when do we need to have a sale because the warehouse is filling up? That kind of coordination is very, very in much in early stages in many companies. What are the implications? Um, where does stuff happen? And John talked about it yesterday, this no notion of decentralization and recentralization. What happens when everybody's got sensors all over their person or their truck or their machine tool? What happens when you've got Siri in your pocket? Well, Siri has to talk to a cloud-based data center to get the answer. Siri is not in your pocket. Siri is a connection to a cloud data center. So, in fact, we do have smaller and smaller and smaller, more and more and more user devices, but we have bigger and bigger, bigger, more centralized data centers in, in a cloud world. So what gets decentralized and pushed out to the edge? We talked about, for example, music pressing. We talked about movie making. We talked about newspapers over and over again. So decentralization blows apart old business models, but then a lot of things are now getting recentralized. So John's talk yesterday was right on to this and this whole notion of what, what's the edge and what's the core. Um, supply chains are very much playing in that world. What constitutes a moat? What constitutes a competitive barrier to entry that nobody can cross without great pain, great effort? Is it knowledge? Is it location? Is it capital? And in many, many cases, we're finding that these things are very much fungible, and so moats are much more permeable than they used to be. People talent, we'll talk about in a little bit, personalization. In the new manufacturing world, what does it mean to have my version of your item? Whether it's a capital item like a tractor or a GE jet engine, or it's a consumer device, whether it's a keychain. And so this notion of how do you have supply chains for units of one is going to be a major challenge, and 3D printing is obviously a piece of this, but it's by no means the whole picture. Personalization, for my money, I think the most interesting things happening right now are in prosthetics. I think 3D printing has the possibility, 3D printing and associated technologies, right, not just by itself, has the potential to change the medical device industry just radically. Right now, your local hospital has a very expensive inventory of artificial hip joints and knees. These are made of titanium and expensive advanced materials. They're very expensive to warehouse and they don't really fit you that well because you're you, you're unique. How soon till we get personalized medical implants? How soon till we get personalized car seats? Everybody's car seat profile is unique. Did you know that? It's as unique as your fingerprint. If I have the right sensors on a car seat, I can tell who you are. So why shouldn't my car seat fit me perfectly? Finally, well-being and jobs. What do we do when Machines do a better job than people at more and more tasks, whether it's driving a truck, whether it's melding metal, whether it's um, calculating derivatives and um, uh, Wall Street portfolios. So this notion of the universal basic income, the guaranteed in individual income, is a fascinating conversation that's just jump-starting in the last few years. 
That is, you deserve an income for being a person, for being a citizen. And we're going to pay you to be a citizen of our country. Right now, Switzerland is going to consider that at a referendum next month, I believe. 40% of people are expected to vote for it. Switzerland, a country with an incredible work ethic, and yet they're saying, yes, the notion of a basic income may be the logical outcome of all this automation. The fact that supply chain robots are better than people at moving stuff around. The fact that autonomous trucks are better than people than truck drivers, who, by the way, have very short life expectancies. It's a very, very bad ergonomic, health-wise uh, trade-off to be a long-haul truck driver, which is why very few people want to do it. And then well-being. What do we do about all the people who work in those warehouses, the people who can benefit from all these consumer devices, all the radiation we're ingesting? Um, what about who knows about my sensor output? Um, I think Salim was right on it, that, that we're going to have to renegotiate a lot of the social contract in light of information abundance down to the genomic level. So this is a conventional supply network. Kraft has those big green distribution centers. They're geographically spread out. And this is what space tends to look like if you're a supply chain person. You sort of say, okay, we're going to you know, average out population density and road quality, and here we go, here's where we put our warehouses. This is how Amazon does it. They cluster. Nobody's ever built a, demand, a supply network like this before. Let's zoom in a little bit. Here's Pennsylvania. There's 11 fulfillment centers in Pennsylvania. They're not geographically spread out. They're clustered around major um, road junctions. They're not really all that close to cities. There, you notice that there are 11 on the other chart, if you're counting. There's only nine on the map because two of them are basically doubled up. They're on the corner from each other, basically. They're, they're one peg represents two days, uh, fulfillment centers. Nobody's ever built a network like this before. And so we're in the middle of it. This is what an algorithmically driven, advanced, heavily robotic demand chain, supply chain looks like. What are the barriers? We obviously talk about the future and how exciting this all is, and there's a lot of good stuff happening. Our infrastructure is not ready for it. Legally, what are my rights as a manufacturer? If I'm CAT, if I'm GE, if I, if I make something and you can scan it and make a copy of it, what are the, do we do like we do now with color printers. We put a little, uh, a little speck in so you cannot color print money as a counterfeiter. Do we have the equivalent bit that we put into 3D printing machines so you can't copy certain kinds of materials? Our physical infrastructure. We talked a lot about autonomous vehicles. What happens when an autonomous vehicle has to choose between a pothole and a bicycle? Right now, Google is piloting in Palo Alto, which has really nice, smooth roads. There's no such thing as frost heave in Palo Alto. Come to Pennsylvania, Google. Try it there. Okay? Roads, qual road quality is a huge barrier to autonomous vehicles. And then the cultural infrastructure, and which Salim talked about, right? What are the rights to privacy? What are the rights to an income? What are the rights to work? And supply chains are very much wrapped up in this. Because supply chains, factory work, logistics work, warehouse work, have often provided entry-level employment for people with low educational attainment, for veterans, for a lot of other people like that. What happens when this gets automated and you get much, many more robotics, many more autonomous uh, entities, a lot more algorithmic optimizations? Another barrier is complexity and speed. The margin for error at Tesla, Elon Musk got up and said, hey, we only had a part shortage of six out of 8,000 pieces. Six out of 8,000, that's a great batting average. It still stopped the line. So you have zero margin for error, and many of you who work in manufacturing know this, and it's sort of pedestrian, and it's sort of uh, not glamorous like CRISPR, but the fact is you're talking about tiny margins of error and a lot of very, very hard execution to get a car out the door that's safe, that's reliable, that's predictable, that's able to be maintained. It's not easy. 
Talent is going to be a huge issue, and I know many companies in the room are wrestling with this. We have an online master's in supply chain. I've seen students from GE. I've seen students from Caterpillar. I have graduates working at Deloitte. And so the human capital question is really pressing. There are not enough good people out there. And finally, the growing pains. What are we going to do as we go from the old regime to the new regime? What will be the unexpected consequences that trip us up? What are the unknown unknowns? So, to end, these aren't exponential curves, these are stock prices, but they're pretty darn good. 1985, Toyota opened the joint venture with General Motors in 86. Look what their stock price did. It goes from $10 a share to $40 a share in about three years. It's not exponential, but that's pretty good performance. My point from the beginning, if you can spot a supply chain breakthrough early, you can make a lot of money. This happens again and again. Here goes Walmart. Walmart finishes their U.S. build-out. They, they built their final store in their final state and completed the sort of basic footprint in 1995. They joined the Dow Jones in 96, and then look what happens. They can start to capitalize on all that investment, all that infrastructure they put in place, and the share price, again, quintuples in a matter of a very short time. This would be Dell. Again, supplying build-to-order desktops to the internet revolution starting about 96, 97. This is Apple, starting with the introduction of the iPhone. You think the iPhone, oh, that's engineering, that's exponential, that's marketing, that's design. All true, it's also supply chain. Some of the smartest decisions about the iPhone were locking up the worldwide supply of flash memory with futures contracts so that you preclude uh, copycats from coming into the market. It turns out that's semi-legal. You can't really do it all that much. But the fact is, Apple supply chains, a combination of owned and uh, contracted out, are second to none. And Amazon, can't stop without Amazon. And I probably stopped the uh, graph too soon given their last couple of weeks. You start looking at 2012 when they start to invest heavily in the data centers and the uh, Amazon Web Services and the new distribution network, and they bought the robotics company. And so Amazon stock, after everybody keeps saying, oh, yes, they've, you know, who, who would want to buy books online? Who would want to buy music online? Who would want to buy a Kindle reader? Who would want to buy a Prime subscription? They just keep getting it done. So who's next? Tesla is going to be really interesting to watch. The question is, can they deliver 400,000 vehicles that haven't even been designed yet fully by two years from now? And also, they have a major exodus of some of their senior talent. My money is on BMW and Apple somehow teaming up. BMW is already making an electric car. Apple needs to get a new revenue stream into their mix. I think that we could see something really interesting. I have no inside information whatsoever, but... Culturally, the two are a great fit, and I think that's something to watch. Toyota has made a massive investment in robotics, um, billions of dollars in both autonomous vehicle research. They've hired away some of the top people in the world from Google, for, for example, but also care robots. Who's going to take care of all us old people? Amazon goes without saying, who's going to be the FedEx of drones? Who's going to come up with a business plan that says that'll never work and rethink the entire logistics landscape? And then finally, I'm not sure if it's going to be Dell or maybe the Kinkos of 3D printers. So it's an exciting time, I think a fascinating place to be, and when you're looking at all these exponentials, don't overlook the supply chain because even though we're silent, we're pretty important. Thank you.